All right. Today we're going to talk about the unpardonable sin. And uh, I, here are my study notes for it. You can see up there, July 25th, 2010 is when I originally did this study. And um, it's amazing what the Lord has done uh, over the years, last 12 years. <laughs> um, I do have this as an audio sermon, um, but I wanted to re-preach it because there's some other points I'd like to make. But uh, it's just amazing how I, you know, back in the past I had to write the whole thing out on computer and I had to write out what I was supposed to say. You know, and things I was uh, not as familiar with the Bible as I am today. Thankfully, you preach the Word of God a lot over the years. You get to be familiar with it. But uh, let's start out here in Mark chapter 3. What is the unpardonable sin? A lot of people get really upset about this, and it's used by a lot of cults to, uh, you know, make a big deal. Guy with a weed eater out here, if you're hearing that. Um, But uh, a lot of cults use the unpardonable sin as a way to scare people into submission. And, uh, well, you've blasphemed the Holy Ghost. You've committed the unpardonable sin. You need to be careful what you're saying. You need to be careful who you're judging. And oh, because you might have committed the unpardonable sin. You know, yeah. All right, let's start out here. Mark chapter 3, verse 5. And when he had looked round about on them with anger, being grieved for the hardness of their hearts, he saith unto the man, Stretch forth thine hand. And he stretched it out, and his hand was restored whole as the other. Um, Jesus had a cause to be angry. Okay? Um, he wasn't angry and therefore in you know, a danger of damnation or whatever like the one passage t speaks about. He had a cause. And there's plenty of causes. There are plenty of causes out there for a Christian to be angry about things. Um, jump down to verse 22. Uh, the same chapter, Mark chapter 3, verse 22. And the scribes which came down from Jerusalem said, He hath Beelzebub, and by the prince of the devils casteth he out devils. I've gotten that thing numerous times. <laughs> People, you know, they're, oh, you're devil possessed and you're whatever else because we don't like the doctrine that you preach and whatever. And we disagree with you, so you must be devil possessed or something like that. Well, not a big deal for me because I'm not God manifest in the flesh. But uh, when you say that to God manifest in the flesh, that's a problem. Okay? Look down at verse 28. Jesus speaking here, he says, Verily I say unto you, all sins shall be given, forgiven unto the sons of men, and blasphemies wherewith soever they shall blaspheme. But he that shall blaspheme against the Holy Ghost hath never forgiveness, but is in danger of eternal damnation. Because they said he hath an unclean spirit. See, they're looking at the Godhead right there, and they're saying that spirit that's in you, that's an unclean spirit. It's a spirit of Beelzebub. It's the devil speaking through him. And Jesus says, that's the unpardonable sin here. It doesn't say unpardonable by word there, but it's a sin that's not ever forgiven. You're in, in danger of eternal damnation. All right. Um, let's see where I'm reading to here. Yeah, okay, verse 30. Um, now let's go to uh, Acts chapter 18. A little confusing trying to read my old notes with all the stuff that I have written there. Acts chapter 18, verses 5 and 6. But Jesus warns them, about blaspheming, you know, you better be careful about blaspheming the Holy Ghost. Um, does anybody else ever do that? No. It's a big clue to what the unpardonable sin is here, in other words. Um, Jesus is the only one that could claim it and say, hey, you've committed the unpardonable sin. Uh, sinners saved by grace like myself and the apostles and things and any Christian that's ever lived. Um, we can't say, hey, you've blasphemed the Holy Ghost. You never see that in the scriptures. So if some preacher or hireling or whatever is trying to put that on you, it um, doesn't mean anything. Acts chapter 18, verse 5. And when Silas and Timotheus were come from Macedonia, Paul was pressed in the spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus was Christ. And when they opposed themselves and blasphemed, he shook his raiment and said unto them, Your blood be upon your own heads. I am clean from henceforth. I will go unto the Gentiles. I didn't see anything in there about you blasphemed the Holy Ghost. 
you've committed the unpardonable sin. You, you cannot be forgiven for the... He didn't say anything like that. Jesus is the only one that ever warned anybody about committing this unforgivable sin. Luke chapter 12, verse 10. Luke chapter 12 and verse 10. It says here, And whosoever shall speak a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But unto him that blasphemeth against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven. Okay? Again, he's speaking there. In context, he's saying, if you speak against me, being the flesh of God, okay, you can be forgiven. You're ignorant. These people, forgive them, Father, that they know not what they do. See? They didn't understand who he was. But if you speak against the Spirit that is in Jesus Christ... That's a problem, just like the Jews had already done there, you know, in the book of Mark. All right, now let's go to Matthew chapter 12. We'll see here the thing about this unpardonable sin. Matthew chapter 12, verse 31. Matthew chapter 12, verse 31 and 32. Wherefore I say unto you, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men, but the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. And whosoever speaketh a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whosoever, shall speak, whosoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him. Now look at this. Here's the key about this whole unpardonable sin thing. It shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world, neither in the world to come. Okay? Um, you speak against the Holy Ghost. You've blasphemed the Holy Ghost. What does that mean? You're going to go to hell and there, it cannot be forgiven you. Uh, really? Uh, I don't think hell is a world. It shall not be forgiven him in this world, neither in the world to come. It's kind of weird. Why would Jesus say that? Well, very simple. I'll just spell it right out for you. Jesus is saying the time that he's there on the earth the first time, his first coming, came to die on the cross to pay for sins, neither in this world, neither in the world to come, the millennial kingdom. Which is really a problem for you if you're a post-millennial or amillennial especially or a preterist or whatever else. Um, any of these you know, knuckleheads that don't believe in the premillennial coming of Jesus Christ, that it's yet in the future, you know, it's promised to Jesus Christ, oh no, it, it's already happened, it's poetically you know symbolic of something you know there's some of these heresies that they're just they get all this detailed stuff but it's really just a simple answer if you believe the king james bible the bible says that there's a thousand year reign of jesus christ on the earth and saints are a promised inheritance in that time jesus will physically rule on the earth they come to jerusalem to see the king it's the city of the great king i mean i've done whole studies on the millennial reign of jesus christ and these wing nuts come along and they say well Actually, let me just explain to you what happened. All the prophecies were fulfilled in the first century, and, and um, historicism and preterism is the true way. And I've been getting some of this in the comments too. And, and, and all these things, I just think you're stupid. You know, you're, you're an idiot. Okay, I'm trying to be kind here um, because you're actually lower than that. But you know, it already happened. Everything already happened in the past. And we can see the global government coming in and we can see the implantable microchips that will be the mark of the beast and the central bank digital currencies. And we, we can see Bible prophecy coming to pass, but no, no, it's not actually Bible prophecy. It would already happen in the past symbolically. Yeah, okay. Um, no, there's a world to come where you can blaspheme Jesus Christ because he's physically on the earth. Okay? Uh, it's very simple. The unpardonable sin is you blaspheme God manifest in the flesh. It isn't some kind of a thing, well, hey, I was you, you know, I say something stupid. Well, that wasn't the Holy Spirit speaking through me, it was just my own flesh. Well, okay. I'm just a man, I'm just a preacher. I don't mean anything, you know, whatever. But Jesus Christ, when he's on the earth, and everything he says is right, every thought he has is perfect, he's without sin, and you say, He has a devil in him. Oh boy, you're in trouble. You are calling God manifest in the flesh, devil possessed. That's a problem. That's why it won't be forgiven to you in that world when he's physically on the earth. 
neither in the world to come when he's physically on the earth the second time. Pretty easy, okay? Oh, well, you know, um, you know, we can, but you see the historic position of, well, we, we can prove to you that the real way of it, run along, <laughs> um, read something here from a charismatic website, uh, ladderrain.com is what it was, quote, have you ever heard a person say that if you speak in tongues, you have an evil spirit? That is speaking against the Holy Ghost, but it can also be forgiven. For a pastor of a church to despise prophecy and forbid the word of the Lord to proceed to the congregation is speaking against the Holy Ghost. It is a very serious offense to actively oppose the moving of the Spirit, especially if it is being taught as doctrine. Teachers have a greater responsibility to the truth. We have the same Spirit in us now that Jesus did then. If this is the blasphemy of the Holy Ghost that the Pharisees committed, then it is the same for us. No, it isn't. No, it isn't. Stupid charismatic devils. There can be no other explanation except the accusation that the devil is causing the true manifestation of spiritual gifts and the power to cast out demons. Yeah, there. Now I have seen love cover a multitude of sins. Is love enough to cover this type of blasphemy? If you are led by the Lord and hear his voice and speak the truth, you cannot come against spiritual gifts unless you take yourself out of the spirit and speak in the flesh. It happens all the time with Christian teachers that have the spirit, but not in fullness. <laughs> Crazy. Cuckoo. Uh, nonsense. But you see, the charismatic church is one of those satanic heresies out there. There's a whole list of them. I'd like to actually write a book someday on it. I probably will. About the heresies that are out there, the most serious ones. But the charismatics are one of the most satanic cults out there. My grandparents were charismatics, Pentecostal charismatics. Actually, my great-grandfather was one of the first Pentecostal preachers, I believe, in America, um, going back to the 1800s. And um, because Methodist, the Methodist system came around with their tent rot, revival meetings, and they got into the jerks and, and the shakes and the rolling around on the floor and barking like dogs and whatever. And then they had some splits, and they basically split off to the Pentecostal movement and then they got into the charismatic thing and all the other stuff and very sordid history where the whole Pentecostal charismatic movement comes from. But uh, they use fear as a tactic to control the people. And people, they're just deathly afraid of speaking against anybody. Some guy goes, just making up a bunch of jibber jabber. And I do that and they go, oh, you've blasphemed the Holy Ghost. Oh, uh, no, I didn't. Um, I blasphemed, a, a, I didn't blaspheme anything. I made fun of some idiot that was faking the, the speaking in tongues. I didn't blaspheme the Holy Ghost, but you see, they use that power over people. Okay, the only way that you can blaspheme the Holy Ghost in somebody is if you do it when Jesus is physically on the earth, neither in this world or in the world to come, or neither in this world, in the world to come. You can't blaspheme some guy up there doing it. I mean, show me in scripture. They're blaspheming the Holy Ghost, you know, the, the truth and whatever else. And Paul says, you blaspheme the Holy Ghost. He didn't say, well, you, you know, you've committed the unpardonable sin. You've, you've come against me because, you know, hey, you're, you're sinning, you're wicked and whatever else. You're blaspheming. And we'll see here in a little bit that uh, you can actually be forgiven if you blaspheme right now. So, Acts chapter 2 Go to Acts chapter 2. Let's talk about this thing of speaking in tongues. Acts chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. <clears throat> and when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men, out of every nation under heaven. Let me just stop right there. Um, there are two types of speaking in tongues, or two types of tongues, we'll say, in the New Testament. You have the miraculous tongues that are given as a sign gift to the Jews um, in the book of Acts. And then you have the actual gift of knowing languages, 
tongues, languages and tongues are synonymous in the, in the King James Bible. There are people that have diverse kinds of tongues. They learn different languages. There are some brethren that for, for the purpose of Bible translation or missionary work or whatever else, God gives them the gift of learning other languages. That's all it means. That's why there's the interpretation of tongues in 1 Corinthians 14 and 12 through 14, I should say. That's there. There's no interpretation of tongues in Acts chapter 2. All right, to get the, to understand the difference there, the two different types of tongues. Miraculous in the book of Acts, whenever Jews are present, Jews will always be present when there's miraculous tongues being spoken. And the other type of tongues are simply an ability to learn gifts or to learn uh, languages, the gift of learning languages, tongues, in other words. But the, the languages are lifted, listed here, by the way, too. Interesting. Verse 6. Now when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded because that every man heard them speak in his own language. Defines what it is. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? And how hear we every man in our own tongue? I thought it said languages. Tongues are different than languages. No, they're not. They're the same. Same word. Wherein we were born, Parthians and Medes, and Elamites, and the dwellers of Mesopotamia, and in Judea, and in Cappadocia, in Pontus, in Asia, Phrygia, and Pamphylia, in Egypt, and in the parts of Libya, around about Cyrene, and strangers of Rome, Jews, and proselytes, Cretes, and Arabians, we do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. Tongues and languages are the same, and they're all listed right there. There's no unknown tongues, by the way. Whenever you have the miraculous gift of speaking in tongues, it's known. It's a known language. Whatever the language of the Jews are that are gathered there. That's what's going on. The unknown languages of 1 Corinthians chapter 12 through 14. That's why you need an interpreter. Pretty easy to figure that out. Verse 12. And they were all amazed and were in doubt, saying one to another, What meaneth this? Others mocking said, These men are full of new wine. They're mocking? Oh no, uh-oh, unpardonable sin, right? What does Peter say? But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto to them, Ye men of Judea, and ye, all ye that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you, and hearken to my words. For these are not drunken as ye suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And he goes on and he preaches to him. There's no condemnation. He's, there's no, you've blasphemed the Holy you spoke against the speaking in tongues. And this is where it started, by the way. I'd like to point that out. Um, and yet there's no mention of blaspheming the Holy Ghost. Maybe it's because they didn't. <laughs> Little clue there. Um, uh, let's go to John chapter 8. It's going off my old notes here. I have, uh, is it possible today to commit a sin that you can't be forgiven of? John chapter 8, verse 21 and 24. It says here, Then said Jesus again unto them, I go my way, and ye shall seek me, and shall die in your sins. Whither I go, ye cannot come. Then said the Jews, Will he kill himself? Because he saith, Whither I go, ye cannot come. And he said unto them, Ye are from beneath, I am from above. Ye are of this world, I am not of this world. I said therefore unto you, that ye shall die in your sins. For if ye believe not that I am he, ye shall die in your sins. Um, <coughs> Jesus makes an absolute statement there about somebody that doesn't believe that he is the Father. That's what it's talking about in context. Um, how do you know? Verse 19. Then said they unto him, where is thy father? Jesus answered, Ye neither know me nor my father. If ye had known me, ye should have known my father also. You know, if ye believe not that I am he, ye shall die in your sins. He doesn't say anything about the Messiah or anything else there in the passage. It's talking about if ye believe not that I am the father, you know, in terms of he's the son and the father are different, in terms of son is the body, father is the soul. Understand the difference there in the Godhead. But they're the same being, they're the same person. You'll never find plural persons in relation to Jesus Christ, or into the Godhead, I should say. Um, <coughs> you'll never see it. Okay, um, just as simple as that. Um, Second Peter chapter three. Second 
Second Peter chapter three verse nine. Um, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise as some men as some men count slackness, but is long suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God's not willing that any should perish. So this whole thing of, well, you've committed the unpardonable sin, now you can't get saved or something, that's nonsense. Complete nonsense. Don't ever fall for that. Um, God wants sinners to repent. And it doesn't mean going from unbelief to belief either, by the way. That's a bunch of nonsense that uh, Jack Hiles came up with that. And um, a lot of this philosophical Gnostic uh, movement, they came out with this whole thing of, it means going from unbelief to belief. Uh, okay, well, you can go from unbelief to belief and be a Gnostic. Gnosticism, it's all up here. You would visualize things and I believe that I'm saved and therefore I am. I believe that I'm a Thanksgiving turkey, you know, on Christmas morning or something. And you can believe anything. Um, Romans chapter 1, verse 28. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. Um, God can turn people over to a reprobate mind. God can harden your heart, or you can harden your heart, excuse me, to the gospel, and then God just says, okay, fine. Um, you have to be very careful about that stuff. Right now I have here, all lost people will blaspheme the Lord in one of three ways. Okay. Leviticus chapter 24. Go back to the Old Testament. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus. Get to numbers, you've gone too far. Leviticus chapter 24. Verse 10 through 16. And the son of an Israelitish woman, whose father was an Egyptian, went out among the children of Israel. And this son of the Israelitish woman and a man of Israel strove together in the camp. And the Israelitish woman's son blasphemed the name of the Lord and cursed. And they brought him unto Moses, and his mother's name was Shelemith, the daughter of Dibri, the, of the tribe of Dan. And they put him in ward, that the mind of the Lord might be showed them. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Bring forth him that hath cursed without the camp, and let all the, that heard him lay their hands upon his head, and let all the congregation stone him. Um, and thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel, saying, Whosoever curseth his God shall bear his sin. And he that blasphemeth the name of the Lord, he shall surely be put to death, and all the congregation shall certainly stone him, as well the stranger, and he, as he that is born in the land, when he blasphemeth the name of the Lord, shall be put to death. And they did. They killed him. Um, interesting thing there was an interracial marriage, very much forbidden in the Old Testament. Um, but uh, it's interesting, too, the Lord made sure to record her name, the mother's name, because of the foolish thing that she did there, you know, Shelemith. But uh, it says there that he has to bear his own sin. In verse uh, 15, Whosoever curseth his God shall bear his sin. Well, if you bear your sin, what do you do? You go to hell. You pay for your sin. The wages of sin is death. Kind of an interesting thing there. Um, so not a good deal. So, you know, if you're going to curse God and blaspheme God and whatever else, well, you'll probably end up bearing your sin, going to hell for that. Psalm 14. Turn next to Psalm 14. Psalm 14 and uh, verses 1 through 3. The fool hath said in his heart, There is no God. They are corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is none that doeth good. The Lord looked down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there were any that did understand and seek God. They are all gone aside. They are all be together become filthy. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. Um, not very uh, good for the atheists out there that say, oh, I'm a good person, I'm not that bad, I'm not a murderer or whatever else. Well, God says that uh, you're not good. So, interesting thing there. 
Um, Revelation chapter 16. And atheists seem to have an affinity for blaspheming the Lord and whatever else. Um, it's funny how atheists become obsessed with Christians. That's the weird thing I've noticed over the years. You know, they get this website, Rational Wiki, and they just, you know, dig into every aspect of my life and my preaching. And they just watch all kinds of hours of my preaching so that they can find anything that I slip up on or any little thing that they can attack me on. If you're an atheist, go out and get a sports car or something or, you know, go climb a mountain or do something with your life that's exciting. You know, don't become obsessed with the thing that you don't believe in. <laughs> Weird. Uh, Revelation 16, verses 8 through 11. And the fourth angel poured out his vial upon the sun, and power was given unto him to scorch men with fire. And men were scorched with great heat, and blasphemed the name of God, which hath power over these plagues, and they repented not to give him glory. And the fifth angel poured out his vial upon the seed of the beast, and his kingdom was full of darkness, and they gnawed their tongues for pain, and blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores, and repented not of their deeds. Uh, so you have people there, again, in the future, they'll be blaspheming God. And uh, interesting that these people, those who have taken the mark of the beast, they can't get saved. Regardless of what some of the you know teachers out there, like John MacArthur and Ken Hovind and some of these other guys, um, try, are trying to come out now and say, well, I think that, you know, maybe you could. And, you know, the Bible's crystal clear. I mean, there, there are some things that you can argue about in the Bible. It's not perfectly clear and whatever else. There's other things. There's no argument. Okay. Nobody can take the mark of the beast and expect to be okay with God for doing that. All right. That's, I just don't understand some people with that. But uh, Revelation chapter 16, verse 21, go there. Or look there. And there fell upon men a great hail out of heaven, every stone about the weight of a talent. And men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail, for the plague thereof was exceeding great. So there's going to be a lot of people who blaspheme God in the time of Jacob's trouble. And um, I believe that the most powerful group of people in the time of Jacob's trouble will be the Roman Catholics. The traditional Catholics that are going to be brought back. The new right that comes back to power. Um... And those people, I've seen them, I've talked to them face to face, and uh, boy, they'll, they can talk all kinds of holy canon law, this and righteous this and whatever else and things, but you push them hard enough and they will start to cuss like, you know, make a sailor blush kind of a thing. It's really weird, strange spirit that's in them. Um, second, or second Timothy chapter 3 verses 1 through 5 says, this know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. Yeah. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures, more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying the power of thereof from such, turn away. Now, is there anything in that list that we don't see in abundance today? <laughs> no. All of the things there we see in abundance. But no, no, actually, no, we don't. Because, you know, everything in Revelation already happened. First century. It's all over. It's all done. Yeah. <laughs> I don't actually have a whole study on preterism. I've kicked it before within studies. I need to come out and actually have one that's dedicated just to that. Um, you know, it's... It's, it, I think the frustrating thing for me is that you have this weird thing where there are some things that should just be obvious to people, that they're just obviously wrong. And yet people come out and they say, well, you know, because I haven't specifically covered it, then, oh, it's the truth now or something, and Brian Denlinger's afraid of it, or you know, he can't cover these things or something. So strange. Um, 1 John chapter 5. 1 John chapter 5. Um, verse 10 uh, through 13. He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. 
He that believeth not God hath made him a liar, because he believeth not the record that God gave of his son. King James Bible. And this is the record that God hath given to us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. Um, can you produce a written book that is your perfect authority and that you don't question? I certainly hope so. Because if you can't, you're lost. Um, Titus chapter 2, verse 5. I'm getting low on battery here, so I have to keep it moving. If it shuts off, then I'll just have to patch into it. Titus chapter 2, verse 5. Speaking about women here, it says, To be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. You can blaspheme this book like a lot of people do. Um, this book is very special to God. Uh, there's no book in history, including the original autographs, including Hebrew, including Greek, that's been able to produce as much fruit of this as this King James Bible. This is the greatest book ever written. No question about it. Um, 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 1. Let as many servants as are under the yoke count their own masters worthy of all honor, that the name of God and his doctrine be not blasphemed. Yes, God does care about his word, his doctrine. He doesn't want it to be blasphemed. Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10, verse 17. So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Gone over that verse many times. Um, you don't believe the Bible, uh, the written word, you can't claim salvation. You reject the word of God, well, what grounds do you have then for even saying that you're saved? All right, I'm going to take a break here for just a minute. I'll be right back. I need to go get some uh, something here to change the battery or something like that. Um, so if you just give me a minute, I'll be right back. All right, I'm back. You can turn to Isaiah chapter 65. Um, thought I had enough battery power to do the study today without charging it, but uh, no. So technical difficulties. Isaiah chapter 65 and verse 7. The lost uh, world can blaspheme God by worshiping Him not in His way, though. Isaiah 65 verse 7. Your iniquities and the iniquities of your fathers together, saith the Lord, which have burned incense upon the mountains and blasphemed me upon the hills. Therefore will I measure their former work into their bosom. Uh, God is not worship, interested in false worship. In other words, Ezekiel chapter 20. There's an awful lot of professing Christians out there and they uh, have their worship services and it's just flesh shows is all it is. It's what they want. It's what they like. Go to the church and find the one that uh, you know has services that you like, that you prefer. Um, it's not the way it's supposed to be. You worship God His way. Ezekiel 20, verse 27 through 31. Therefore, son of man, speak unto the house of Israel, and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Yet in this your fathers have blasphemed me, blasphemy there, and that they have committed a trespass against me. For when I had brought them into the land, for the which I lifted up mine hand to give it to them, then they saw every high hill and all the thick trees, and they offered there their sacrifices, and there they pre presented their provocation of their offering, there also they made their sweet savor and poured out their drink offerings, poured out there their drink offerings. Then I said unto them, What is the high place whereunto ye go? And the name thereof is called uh, Bema unto this day. Wherefore say unto the house of Israel, Thus saith the Lord God, Are ye polluted after the manner of your fathers, and commit ye whoredoms after their abominations? Um, for when ye offer your gifts, 
When you make your sons to pass through the fire, you pollute the, yourselves with all your idols, even unto this day, and shall I be inquired of by you? <laughs> and you want to ask me for, you know, pray to me and ask me for favors in your life? Really? You're worshiping me falsely. You're blaspheming me. All these people, I don't care what the Bible says. I don't need a perfect Bible. It doesn't matter. You and your bibliolatry, Denlinger, you're, you're crazy. You worship that old book. You always hold up this King James Bible and this, the, oh, it's the best book and all that. We do it our way. We do what feels good. God loves us. He, he wants us to, he, God works through our feelings. Um, no, he doesn't. No, he doesn't. If he thought it was abomination back then and they were doing their own worship type of stuff and God's saying, this isn't for me. If it was like that in the Old Testament, it's like that today. John chapter 4. <clears throat> Back to the New Testament. John chapter 4. Verse 23. More things on worshiping God and making sure you're not blaspheming Him. But the hour cometh and now is when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship Him. God is a spirit, and they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. Well, I don't, I don't want to... Yeah, I remember the one time I was knew some brethren and they went to this youth, like a place or something like this you know it wasn't just a youth group it was actually a ministry for the youth you know the in the area of the secular youth and they went in there and and uh, the one brother he had actually gone to this when he was young and so he knew some of the counselors and the church people that were running the thing and he came back and he said you know i'm saved now and whatever and they said oh yeah well, you come and you can volunteer your time to work with these troubled youths and and things and so him and another brother did and they and they started to to sit down with the King James Bible and actually take these young people through the scriptures and show them prophecy type of things and whatever else, starting to speak a little bit too much truth. And they were told, they were called on the carpet for doing that. And they said, look, they said, we don't focus on doctrine here. It's more on a good time, fellowship and fun. We're just, we don't really want the really meaty doctrine thing. We're just trying to give these lost youths, you know, a nice place to come and hang out. And this brother said, yeah, but they wanted to hear the truth. They were asking the questions. They're responding. They're, they're anxious to hear the truth. We don't want it here. This isn't the place for doctrine. This isn't the place for truth. And how many of these church buildings are like that? Hey, I want to come in and start telling the truth. Let me tell you what the Bible says about this sin over here and this sin over there. Uh, 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 come on. Okay. You're ruining the atmosphere. Okay then you're not really worshiping Jesus Christ because you see, he wants worship that's in spirit and in truth. So it's kind of funny how the, uh, these people, they come out and they say, you know, well, I'm, um, I'm militant for the truth and everything else here. And, and, or excuse me, the charismatics, uh, they come out and they say, you know, we're, you, we don't want to blaspheme the Holy Ghost and whatever else, and they, they blaspheme in their services because they reject the truth. Interesting how that works. Um, John chapter 14. John chapter 14. Verse... Uh, 15 through 17. If ye love me, keep my commandments, and I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. But ye know him, for he dwelleth with you, and shall be in you. And that's interesting, too, if you understand the Godhead doctrine. Jesus says in verse 18, I will not leave you comfortless, I will come to you. So he promises that he's going to send the Comforter, the Holy Spirit there, which you can see in um, verse 26 of the same chapter. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, Holy Ghost and Holy Spirit are synonymous. But Jesus says, I'm going to send the Holy Ghost to you, the Comforter. And then he says, I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. What does that mean? Jesus can say that he is the Holy Ghost because it's the same being. 
Hmm. So, uh, let's see here. John chapter 14, verse 6. Um, Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Again, is that preached in most of these church buildings? Is that really something that people do? No man cometh unto the Father but by me. There's no other way to get to heaven. Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. Um, in uh, chapter 5, verse 8. Not going to be doing a whole lot of these uh, old sermon notes because they confuse me like crazy. <laughs> There's too much writing on them. Right now, it's just a lot of times I just you know write out the scriptures and the Lord shows me what to speak when I get to them. Um, Ephesians chapter 5, verses 8 through 10. Uh, For ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of, of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. Again, truth is very important there. So, but now we'll finish this by asking the question, can someone be saved if they have blasphemed in ignorance? In other words, as a lost person today. Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 1. It's kind of an interesting thing here. Um, 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 12 through 16. We'll read that here in a minute. But it's an interesting thing. I've dealt with charismatics in person, and they all believe if you blaspheme the Holy Ghost that there's no forgiveness and whatever, and yet they believe that you can lose your salvation and then get it back, and then lose your salvation and then get it back. And they'll quote verses of Scripture that don't teach that. It's funny how that works. But what about the thing of blaspheming? Can you commit blasphemy and be forgiven for it? 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 12. And I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who hath enabled me, for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry, who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. He obtained mercy because he did it ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. Albeit for this cause I obtained mercy, that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering, for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. Paul was a very wicked blaspheming Jew at one point in time, and the Lord saved him. The Lord didn't say, hey, you've committed the unpardonable sin, sorry. Uh, he blasphemed. He did it in ignorance and unbelief. Uh, but he was forgiven. So, can you commit the unpardonable sin today? Absolutely not. Uh, it's a very simple, basic doctrine of Scripture. Uh, neither in this world, neither in the world to come. Very simple. Blaspheming the Holy Ghost, where it's unpardonable, it's unforgivable, can only happen when God is manifest in the flesh on the earth. That's the only time that it can happen. Okay? So do not let anybody control you or try to get messing with your head or whatever else, trying to threaten you. You better be careful. Oh, you've spoken against a man of God. You spoke against speaking in tongues. You would better be careful. I can't tell you how many times I've gotten that online and in person as well. Um, I've had relatives tell me that. You know, I start ripping on Rick Warren or Billy Graham or somebody, and they say, oh, and they kind of back up. They'll take a step back and they say, you better be careful. Oh, you better be careful. Or if I start saying, hasta la shantai, antai, bow tie, you know, you know Oh, 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 you know, like it's some kind of a, oh, you've done it. You've committed the unpardonable sin. No, I haven't. It's not possible. Jesus isn't physically on the earth. Okay, so um, if you're out there and you've blasphemed God, you've used God's name in, in vain, you've mocked this book and whatever else, uh, you can still come to your senses and get saved. Okay, please understand that. Um, so... I mean, whosoever will, let him come. You can get saved. So that is going to be it for this study. Sorry it was a little bit confusing, a little bit uh, all over the place there. 
a lot of traffic out here today. If you're hearing that, I apologize for that. Um, I'm glad I don't write my sermon notes this way anymore. <laughs> uh, but just a little little thing here at the end um, before I close this video, and that is uh, tomorrow. This will be this video here is for Saturday night. And then tomorrow, Sunday morning, I'm going to be actually re-uploading an old audio sermon uh, from 2011. And a uh, good sermon. And I was trying to think why I took down a lot of these audio sermons. Well, the reason was because I had the ministry, an old ministry address at the end. And so I didn't want to confuse people. And I thought, eh, you know, I better take some of these old audio sermons down. Um, but I'm going to probably, probably occasionally put them back up and just remove the old address there and things and get in there and and um, change things around and stuff so uh, this one here I thought well I'll just re-preach this one and I was actually going to re-preach my study on the thing of pleading the blood that will be the audio sermon for tomorrow and um, I was going to re-preach that one and it was kind of a weird situation because I was quoting from an older website the website's still there the article's still there, but I think they changed a few things, so I thought, eh, I'll just I'll leave it as the old study. But um, as I was writing, and here's the here's the big kind of announcement. Um, as I was writing the sermon notes for uh, this pleading the blood study and whatever else, I was writing it out, and I got to a place where I was in John chapter six and. Um, getting into the thing of Jesus saying, eating my flesh, drinking my blood, and, and the interpretation of that and whatever. And uh, this is the weird one, okay, because a long time ago, I would say probably back um, 2010, probably somewhere in there, before I even knew my wife, we had the Bible Believers group here on YouTube. I was the president of it, and anybody could come along and join it. And they could post videos to the community kind of forum thing or whatever. And so it was my job a lot of times to check out new members and people would alert me and say, I think this guy's a heretic or whatever else. Um, he's in here trying to make trouble, you know, and I would go in and delete them, get them out of the group. And uh, there was this guy that put up this video and I have sirens out here. There goes the ambulance. Lots of distractions today. <laughs> um, so anyhow, uh, my dad used to call those the meat wagon. He was an ambulance driver, drove for many years, EMT for 25 years. Uh, if you haven't heard my stories about that. But um, anyhow, so this study I watched, this there was a guy that posted a video and, it, and the Camera lighting was awful. I mean, the whole room was orange. He looked orange. Uh, really, you know, not a good camera for low light applications and things. You do that, you film it in a, in a low light area. It'll get make everything look orange or red. And this guy did this video, and he was kind of a little bit, you know, eccentric, a little weird. And I watched this video, and it was just kind of, you know, I was listening to him while I was doing some other work. And all of a sudden, he made some really amazing points, just some phenomenal stuff, just tying scriptures together. Just blew my mind. And another guy at the time that I knew, another brother, and he was part of the Bible-believing group. And he said, we got to talking one day on the phone, and he said, he said, did you see the, the Orange Man video? Not a reference to Donald Trump. <laughs> and, and I said, yeah, the guy about the, the body and the blood and all that. And, and he said, yeah. He said, wasn't that phenomenal? And I said, yeah, it was amazing. I said, I'm going to actually watch it again and take notes this next time. I went back to find that video and it was gone. And I searched and I searched and I looked at my history and everything and it was gone. I mean, it was just, it disappeared. And it was one of the most amazing studies I'd ever heard tying scriptures together. And I have literally been trying for 12 years to get back to that study and to actually go and do the study myself. And Lord, I've been praying off and on. Could you please show me this whole thing? Well, as I was doing the study notes for this remake of the Pleading the Blood study, which I'm not actually doing now, um, the Lord revealed it to me. He brought it all back to my mind 12 years later. So um, pretty amazing there. Uh, sometimes the Lord doesn't reveal things to you right away. 
it might take a few years but brought it back to my mind and it's turning into a major study and you know I'm a, I'm a dad and I'm a husband and, and it's you know we have a lot of things that I do outside of the ministry uh, again to explain that um, back in 2014 my son was born Oliver and for many years he was just a baby you know and my wife took care of feeding him obviously and then um, I'd help out with doing the diapers and whatnot but it was pretty much just you know play with the little baby and then he goes down for his nap and he's asleep and I have hours and hours and now my son's older and I'm trying to teach him things and homeschooling and whatever else so there's not quite as much time as there used to be but this study is just becoming a really big thing quite frankly it should be written into a book I believe the, all the tie-ins and scriptures and everything else it is going to be a major uh, study for me and it's I think it's going to really be a blessing to the brethren when I can bring this thing out um, so please do pray for me as I go through the scriptures and study this whole thing um, it's a it's a big study it's going to be multi-part study I'm, I am going to bring it out in a video and just kind of put it out there for the body of Christ just as I did the Godhead doctrine before writing a book on it um, so uh, going to be a very very detailed study so uh, I would appreciate your prayers as I go through that and um, I don't know when it's going to be coming out I wanted to have it done for this week here this Saturday night you know which today's Friday have it done for tomorrow night and or Sunday morning maybe at the latest and there's just no way there's the scripture references the tie-ins and everything it's just way too detailed so um, lawnmower going down the road uh, so um, hopefully you've been encouraged by this thing of the unpardonable sin um, that you can't commit it unless Jesus is physically on the earth don't let anybody control you and, and try to mess with you and, and whatever else if you're newly saved and you hear somebody coming out and they say they threaten you and they say you've committed the unpardonable sin or you're borderline committing it it's not possible unless Jesus is physically on the earth that's why he said neither in this world neither in the world to come we're in between those two Jesus is not physically on the earth right now in spite of what the Pope tries to say uh, okay so that is going to be it and uh, we do appreciate your prayers thank you to everybody out there that donates to the ministry keeps us going and um, we will see you in future videos and uh, like I said I don't know when I'm coming out with the big major study but please do pray for me the Lord really guides me into this whole thing because it's very important so that is going to be it thank you for watching King James Video Ministries has been faithfully preaching and teaching from God's Word since 2008 our YouTube channel has never been monetized and we do not accept money from the lost world because this would violate the scriptures. King James Video Ministries is supported by saved brethren in accordance with 1 Timothy chapter 5 verses 17 through 18. If you have been blessed by our videos, we would ask that you prayerfully consider supporting this ministry financially. You can donate online by visiting www.kingjamesvideoministries.com or by sending a check or money order to King James Video Ministries, P.O. Box 214, Patton, Maine, 04765. Thank you to all who donate to this ministry, and we pray for the Lord's blessing in your lives.